Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural 2023 Rural Arts Symposium. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And as a reminder, the symposium is being recorded. As one of the five program areas within the Nevada Arts Council, the Community Arts Development Program Area supports Nevada's nonprofit arts and cultural organizations, as well as municipalities, public institutions, and multiple communities. In addition, we also provide a variety of resources aimed to build vibrant communities statewide. CAD works to elevate Nevada's arts and culture infrastructure, expand the skill set of Nevada's creative community, and we also facilitate professional development and networking opportunities through various programs and workshops. My name is Michelle Patrick, the Community Arts Development Specialist and ADA Coordinator in Southern Nevada, and I'm joined by my colleague, Erica Hill, the Community Arts Development Specialist in Northern Nevada. Erica will lead us into a quick overview of today's symposium, as well as introductions of all our panelists. Take it away, Erica. Hi, everyone. My name is Erica, as Michelle just introduced me. And we here at the Nevada Arts Council know that our rural communities are rich in art, but we're here today to tell some of those stories. Each rural community has their own history, character, and people who offer something special to both visitors and residents alike. Today, we are welcomed by three distinguished panelists, two of whom participated in our 2023 Nevada Basin Range Exchange, and all of whom are doing phenomenal work throughout their communities. Our Rural Arts Symposium will delve briefly into their momentous work and what they're doing, where they live, and the connections they're making across the state. First, we're gonna hear from Astrid Larson of Goldfield, co-founder of Elsmeralda High Desert Institute and Outlier Studios talking with us today about alternative modes and methods of creating connections, breaking down norms and stereotypes of activating the arts in rural communities, and bringing people together from across the state through exciting projects and programs in Goldfield. Population, approximately 230. <laughs> Next up from Elko, we have Catherine Wines, architect, chairman of the Elko Arts and Cultural Advisory Board, and founding member of the Elko Arts Foundation. Catherine will be sharing with us the important elements of planning and executing the 2019 and 2021 Mural Festival in Elko, and the importance of these events in creating community pride, concealing urban decay, and promoting arts and tourism. Finally, we'll learn about the amazing work happening in Baker from Liz Woolsey, owner, CEO, and Chief Enthusiasm Officer of the Stargazer Inn and Bristlecone General Store since January 2022. Liz will be sharing with us how she has made dreams into realities by creating space for arts, artists, and selling art in Baker. Now that I've briefly introduced our three speakers, and before we begin, I'm excited to introduce and give a warm welcome to Sean Griffin, a celebrated and highly awarded poet and community activist from Virginia City, who has also been recently awarded as a 2023-2024 Nevada Arts Council Literary Fellow. I do have to say he agreed to do this before he found out. Um, and he has graciously offered us an opening reading. Thank you for being here and please take it away, Sean. Thanks, Erica, and good morning, everybody. I appreciate your time. Um, I you know, served on the Arts Council in the early 2000s when Susan Boskop was the director. And so, and I've been in all these communities that are gonna be speaking today and I appreciate them deeply. So I guess first, I just, mostly I wanna help everybody sort of get centered and and focused that this is a crazy time to be talking about arts and humanities the world's on fire and i don't want to ignore that and still the good work goes on i think it's imperative that all of us find a way to be still in this in this chaos and see some fit, some way forward so that um we can continue doing what's necessary and what's important i know throughout time making art when things are upside down seems to almost to be um, a laughable activity. And yet the reverse is actually true. Nothing could be more important. And that's really just what I wanna share this morning. My wife and I just returned from three months in Spain this spring, we took a wonderful uh, breath. And so I thought I'd uh, start out with a poem that might help us get to that place of being centered. And uh, there's a little Spanish in the poem, but don't let it throw you off. You can all speak Spanish anyways. It's entitled in Plaza Aliatar, which is just the plaza where we were living near Granada. In Plaza Aliatar, 
with the white locust bent like an old woman, with the motos and the camionetas cough the cobblestones, and a Spanish couple dressed for church cane the street to the market. Inside the panaderia, the young woman sprinkles flour and sugar on the waiting hands. It is the ornament of peace they seek, the routine bestowal of wheat across the thin wooden counter. An altar of what might be saved, no thing to substantiate, no euro for this, the volley of smiles and the, the warm jasmine air. Today, I am in the radiant company of elders. They will lead me to follow the stones. They will divine the fuente just beyond the door with the blue tile overhead, all sense of direction gone to wind in Plaza Aliatar. And then because this is a rural conference, I want to acknowledge that I've lived my whole life in rural Nevada. Well, you know, after I left, got out of school. Um, <clears throat> and I very much appreciate where we are, how we are, what it means to be here and work in this environment where so few understand it. And, um, and yet uh, we, we do what's necessary. This was a poem written for dear friends who live up in Surprise Valley, north of the Black Rock Desert. Um, they have worked as farmers, ranchers, artists in that valley for 40 plus years. Uh, so there's some references to things they do like grow sheep and farm, et cetera, but it's about us, right? It's about the work we all do. Milkweed, Monarch, Cleavon, Berlin and Sophie. Rural is a name I give to the star in my throat, the Icelandic sheep bending apricots to the grass, the broken harrow bed pitchforked on the drive. Every night the moon begins to squat to swallow what is left of me. By dawn, I am witness again, no more than the juniper ringing the irrigation pond, than my son and grandchildren rising in the rain clouds. I have spent an eternity in these warnered mountains. The crick come down to feed this valley of hay and heifers. Now my name is Silt, and I win the wetlands like smoke in search of a place to lie. I am nearly home in this replica of my heart. The wood house built on stilts from a barn in Fort Bidwell. The melancholy art of friends. How he and I trade love with our hands. Painter, leather worker, steam of 40 years. What is said without words to the dust of life on the land. Thank you so much and have a great conference. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for taking some time out to talk to us and thanks for sharing your prose. We really appreciate you. You bet. I'm sorry. I will have to sign off. Please forgive me. Have a great day. I'll. Uh, I'll you can watch it later. <laughs> okay, I will. I will. Have a great day, you guys. All Thank of you. you. Thank you, Sean. Well, now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Astrid Larson. Hi, everybody. I'm coming to you from my rural office, my pickup truck. I'm really glad to see everybody. And thank you so much for being here. I just want to echo what Sean said, that art is actually one of the biggest movers in, you know, when the world's on fire, that's what art does. Art moves things. And that's the, the best thing that we can step forward into. Uh, so uh, Esmeralda High Desert Institute, I'm the co-founder along with my husband, Richard. We moved up to Goldfield about five or six years ago. Uh, we're working artists and we've had the experience of both living in cities and also rurally. So when we got to Goldfield, we just started doing things. Uh, there's no grocery store, no gas station, no medical care, uh, no health care there at all. An hour and a half is the closest to any sort of uh, health care out there. So we built our studio, Outlier Studios, and we built our shop as uh, Enigmata Esoterica, where we sell our jewelry, et cetera. And then we just started making things. And eventually, we had a seminal conversation with uh, a couple of folks from the Nevada Arts Council, Tia Flores from um, up in Reno. And we ended up starting this nonprofit. And it's definitely just by the skin of our teeth. And it's pretty amazing. So I'm just going to show you a real quick uh, PowerPoint here. And then I'll talk a little bit about stuff. So here we go. Let's see here. 
Okay, we just had an amazing, amazing first year. So I'm gonna talk just a, a little bit about that. This is me and Richard and our dog Scruff. We're looking pretty cleaned up here in Goldfield. We are definitely usually covered with dust and paint. This is the Institute. This is our table in our studio. Our round table is just a, an amazing, you know, both symbol and also just a bedrock for the ideas and, and uh, conversations we have. We've had people say, hey, we want to come visit the Institute. And then we look at each other and we think, oh, well, that's actually the table in our studio. But anyway, um, here's our presentations we had. This just all happened in one year, and it was pretty amazing. So we started off with Tia Flores, um, who most of you know from Sierra Arts. She is a pyrographer and a gourd artist, pretty amazing, and a lifelong multi-generational citizen of Nevada with um, both Navajo and Aztec heritage. Here's a lovely photograph of Tia. She was amazing, came into the community, met tons of people, gave an incredible presentation, and brought her gourds. And that piece that you're seeing there that looks like a basket is actually not a basket. It is a gourd that has been burned into. Here she is in our uh, the space that we've been using. Second up, Gary Reese, who was our botanist historian. We have two focuses. We focus on art also in science and also history moves in there too. So Gary was perfect. He came in to talk about the history and mystery of Joshua trees. Um, he's a botanist and a historian. I will never look at Joshua Trees the same way again. It was absolutely fascinating. He was a great presenter, has a long time background. Here's a great shot of our, our audience. Our top audience is about 17. And I just want to tell you that that's actually huge for Goldfield. And I often tell our presenters, don't equate how many people show up with success. Just look out at the audience and see how many people are like super engaged and actually showed up. And then here's Gary. And then here's one of our audience members. This is this Goldfield, man. Okay, so then we had a wonderful weekend. It was a double hitter. We had geologist Eric Seedorf and photographer Katrina Brown. Eric is a really revered um, eco-geologist known to a lot of the mining industry folks, and then eventually went in to be a professor down at Arizona State. Uh, he has a love affair with rural Nevada. He spends as much time as he can out there, and he was so gracious to come and talk with us, and we took a field trip with him. So we went up outside of Silver Peak and over Coyote Ridge. Uh, it was a fascinating experience to be with him listening to all the narration. And then he gave a really great presentation. Katrina Brown is a light and astral photographer. She does fantastic work. And she came and gave us a presentation of her work and a little bit about how it was that she did things. Here's like a fan photo. Sorry, I had to put that in there. This is Eric and me. This is Katrina. She's so lovely, so beautiful. This is a great shot that uh, Suzanne Reese took of everybody else um, outside. And we've got some great players here. Um, Jonathan Varini, um, who is the night sky, uh, Nevada and International Night Sky. There's Sign Peter Bob on the right. There's Tia. There's Eric. It was a really wonderful experience. All right. So there's a little bit about Goldfield. I call it creative anthropology. So this is uh, me taking a, a tumbleweed out for a walk. This is the outside of our studio, Outlier Studios. The two sculptures were made by um, Joe up in McDermott, who also goes by the name of uh, White Buffalo. This is our little shop, Enigmata Esoterica. It's in a 1905 uh, falling down adobe. It was a miner's house, and we live in the studio in the back. The shop will take a long time to fix up, but we have the first two rooms in it and wonderful little shop. This is our arts district. And yes, we didn't ask permission. We just decided to do it. We just, uh, we were down in Vegas. We saw their arts district and we're like, wait, we need an arts district. So we just decided we're an arts district. And guess what? We've got a ton of people in Goldfield that are creative sparks. And I really, really invite you to come up, especially in the spring, come up, um, connect up with me and I'll take you around. This is the International Car Forest of the Last Church. This is one of uh, Nevada's preeminent land art installations. It's very strange. It's got a very strange history, but it actually is visited by visitors from all over the world. 
So this is it. This is Doc Meyer. His uh, relatives actually founded the town. Larry Bennett, who is a local artist. Sharon Artlip, total heartbeat of, of Goldfield. This is her twin sister, Nadia. Sharon is the daughter of Slim Cernus, who was one of the first art car artists really in the country. This is Carl and Patty Brownfield. They run a nonprofit radio station. This is Simon Painter Bob, dear to our heart. Tom Farley, also an artist. This is our donkey project. That's kind of how things got uh, kicked off. It was COVID. Um, Tim Hip, who was our uh, county commissioner at the time, actually got a grant from the state of Nevada that combined art with COVID safety awareness. So we were hired to uh, cut out silhouettes of donkeys and to paint them up and to also give them out to various businesses. The only caveat is that they had to wear masks for 30 days. So this is our version. So it was basically to educate the public about keeping safe, putting on masks or donkey projects. These donkeys are still around town. People decorate them. There's one in front of the courthouse. It was really, really fun. It was a great way to, to connect with community. Okay, the school field. And now I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea or a taste of the people that come through Goldfield. And this is a tiny fraction of the fascinating folks that come through. This is Bill Sandell. He's a sculptor and a farmer, uh, former artistic director in the film industry in Hollywood. Here's Sonny Clay and his wife, Sally, who is a meteor hunter. Jenna Rose Nethercott, Nevada Arts Council, gave her a stop on the way to have dinner with us. She's a writer and a puppeteer. You can see one of the donkeys in the background. This is Kenneth and Demise, uh, Demetrice Dalton. They are the nonprofit Our Story. Demetrice is an amazing artist from Reno. Josie Williams, who is a writer, historian, and a collector of um, bottles from one of the early drugstores. She's pretty amazing. Sydney Martinez, influencer and writer. Joan Pei, teacher, artist, and adventure guide. Here's Fallon. Fallon Bourne is a young geologist from Round Mountain. And now I'm going to just zoom you right into the connections, links, and adventures of curiosity that we've been on. So rhizome is something that I really believe you think about, you know, like mushrooms and their little tentacles that go out underground and connect with others. And that's what really what this is all about when you are in rural Nevada is making connections in a very natural, um, in natural way. So these have been really important people to us. Basin to Range was huge. We came up to Ely, met with a ton of people, uh, made a lot of good connections. This is Vogue Robinson, artist and director of development of Left of Center Art Gallery. She's been just a wonderful support and has given us so much good advice about um, just putting a nonprofit together. Liz Woolsey, hey Liz, owner and activator of the Bristlecone General Store. No one, this is a poet that we ran into um, recently. Cloud House, Hu Chen. Hu Chen is an amazing art activist and she has created a community art center out of her own home in Reno, excuse me, Las Vegas. And she is quintessential art activist. And I'll talk a little bit about her more. Brian Martinez, artist and community activist. Laura Rudd, Geological Society of Nevada. She is standing in front of core samples from Nevada that date all the way back to the late 1800s. Kamora Jones, painter and visionary. Catherine Hunt, poet and curator. Joe, aka White Bear, McDermott, Nevada. And then we had our one artist in residence. This is just ticking off the boxes. We had such a blast this year. This is Hugh Chen. Um, Hugh Chen are, uh, came down with um, the theme, Are You a Mirror or a Window? And Hugh came to see the car forest, just really sparked to it, and decided they wanted to create some kind of piece around mending because a lot of the cars in the car forest are kind of broken up. The windshields have been broken up and stuff. So Hugh came and created this really interesting project that combined community participation and also sculpture. Uh, it was hugely successful. Uh, Hugh was basically the representative of the car forest for two days. And I'll show you some pre pretty amazing things. So Hugh made this wonderful jumpsuit that says International Car Forest of the Last Church. Um, you see her interacting with um, one of our Goldfield folks. Here she is. So here Hugh is sitting on top of a car, braiding together some of her sculptural work. And Hugh is here with Fallon Bourne, basically helping the 
uh, people that, that are coming in to drill pieces to take part in it. Have to do this. Have to say huge thanks to everybody that has supported us. This is not a singular effort. This has been many, many people. So I just want to say thanks to the mentors, encouragers, the artists, the scientists, the co-conspirators, the parallel creators, the stakeholders, the board members, and spontaneous acquaintances. Sharon Artlip, Tia Flores, Suzanne Reese, Joan Pay, Nevada Arts Council, Double Scoop, Suzanne Hackett Morgan, Eric Seedorf, Liz Woolsey, Kat Galley, Sydney Martinez, Jerry and Steve Fouts, Hugh Chen, Vogue Robinson, Mike Power, Sarah Westervelt, Katie Fox, Tim Hip, Sign Painter Bob, Mary Noel and David Bowen, Andrea Martinez, Steve Roberts, Edie Kopnick, John Ekman, Brian Smalley, and Tom Farley, rest in peace, and then our art dogs, Scruff and Dodger. And not to forget, very special thank you to Suzanne and Gary Reese, who are our inspirers and were beautifully and very generously our event photographers. So thank you so much. Okay, how much time do I have, you guys? <laughs> thank you, Astrid. Um, you're good. You're good. Um, and this is actually a great uh, segue to let everybody know that there will be a panel discussion that Erica is going to lead after we hear from Liz. Um, and then there'll also be an opportunity for everyone to ask questions afterwards. So um, thank you so much, Astrid. That was amazing. Um, now we're going to move into the land of Elko and we're going to hear from Catherine Wines. Take it away, Catherine. The land of Elko. I like it. Um, well, just quickly before I get into the, the slide presentation, um, I am going to talk about um, the a couple of recent mural projects that we had in Elko. Um, but I'll just give you an introduction of to where the, how those came about. Um, in 2018, um, a nonprofit organization from Reno contacted um, me because I am, as Erica said, um, I'm part of the Arts and Culture Advisory Board that is a basically like a, an advisory board to the city council. It's part of the Elko city government. Um, so in 2018, they contacted me and said, we've done some murals in Reno and we don't want to do them in Reno anymore. We want to do them in rural Nevada. So would Elko like to do some murals? And of course the answer was yes, a resounding yes. So so we worked with them. Um, they unfortunately are not a nonprofit. They're, they're not in existence anymore, but they were um, super helpful and um, they're name was um, Art Spot Reno um, and taught us how to basically facilitate murals in our town. And so that when this opportunity came up, I thought, well, I should like pay it forward and share what I learned about creating public murals with, with other places. Um, so in 2019, we, um, we painted about 56 murals in our downtown area. Um, and then it was so successful and the town loved it so much. And we had such a good time that we thought we got to do this again. So um, Art Spot Reno was moving on to, other, to help other places. So we had to figure out how to do it on our own. Um, so a group of us formed um, the Elko Art Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization um, that is kind of a sister organization to the Arts and Culture Board that's part of, of city government. So we've got kind of these two entities that work together. One of them has a seat at the government table. The other one can raise money really is a lot easier. And, and so it's kind of a, um, it's a great little marriage that we've got with these two organizations to, to really promote the arts and and make Elko, what, one of our goals was to make Elko a regional art destination, which I think we have done. I don't think, I don't think that we're finished yet, but, but we've certainly got a good start to it. So with that being said, um, oh, I, and then, so this new nonprofit decided in 2021, we were going to do some more murals in our downtown. So we did 14 more, um, a lot smaller, um, but we were just getting started. So but and it was a um a great addition to the to the original murals. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Is 
Is that the right one? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I've got two monitors, so I, I never know what's. We can okay, also so see notes. What's that? We can also see your slide notes on the side. Okay, I will try to. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe display settings? Perfect. Did that work? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. So we're, after that introduction, I'm going to start with um, basically what we did in 2021 that we had learned um, from the folks in Reno about putting on an art festival. And um, we decided to, like the whole moniker of Keep It Simple Stupid, it's just the Elko Art Festival, um, very straightforward a part of the Elko Art Foundation. So, um, and what we wanted, what we needed to do first was um, identify the purpose of, of an art festival and what our goals were. So we wanted to beautify the community, which um, in this case, we selected our, down, our historic downtown, um, possibly because it just kind of needed the most attention. Um, it's the oldest part of town. And so of course, with age comes, comes beauty, but also comes kind of um, a little bit of dilapidated areas and um, areas that, that kind of need some attention. Um, we also, based on um, wishes from the Elko um, Convention and Visitors Authority, which basically markets the whole um, to the tourist industry. Um, they were so happy with what we had done in 2019 that they they were a big driving force saying, you guys got to do this again. We need we need more of this. We need we need more art all over. So with their with their help and their blessing, um, we we decided that one of our goals was to to increase um, tourism to the area. Um, we also wanted to use the murals to inform um, our citizens about our history, about our culture, kind of celebrate our culture, make sure that we um, we know that we're we're unique and and kind of special place, which I, I think every place is. But we wanted to be able to um, kind of express that and basically make a billboard. Um, out of our whole downtown about how about our culture and our history. So, and then of course we wanted to promote local art and local artists. Um, in the 2019 festival, about half of the artists were were local, and when I say local, I mean like from the El from Elko County, basically. Um, about half of them were from from out of town like regional and we actually had two international artists, but but for local artists. Um, so then in 2021, we decided that we needed to to maybe shift that a little bit to to get more local artists and and maybe less from from outside the area. And we were able to do that. We I would say like about 60 percent of the artists in 2021 we're from the local area. So of course that um, helps the local economy because one of our goals was to make sure that every artist gets paid. Um, a lot of times people expect, and I, I'm sure I'm speaking, I'm preaching to the choir here, but people expect artists to to work for, for good exposure or you know to promote their name, but good exposure doesn't pay the rent. We all know that. So that's a um one of the like our hard fast rules that that we won't break is every artist is going to is going to get paid for their services so after you identify the purpose and the goal of an art festival then that will figure out what you're going to do and what we decided to do was to create more public murals um and when we say public um, we mean that they're they're visible to anyone. You don't have to pay a, an entrance fee to see them. 
So of course that mostly means um, outside. So what public murals, what we feel that public mural, murals can do is create interesting col colorful moments in otherwise boring areas of your community. Um, it creates a reason for visitors to stop. Um, I heard years ago that um, the difference between a place and a space is if people wanna take a selfie at it, which kind of is a, a 21st century um, definition, but um, everybody wants those selfie moments to put on, on social media, and things like that. So if you've got a place where, where people um, want to create a selfie, then you're doing something. So that's what um, we feel that public murals can do is is bring people in and create those selfie moments. Um, as I talked about a little bit before, it connects citizens to the local history and the culture. And of course that means, you know, when people are engaged, when they're, um, when they're excited about their history and their culture, they take better care of stuff. They, they shop local, they, they do the things that you, you kind of want your citizens to do. They have pride in the community which means maybe they don't litter or, you know, they do things that are that are going to promote community rather than than detract from it. So anytime you can um, create those those connections, create connecting your citizens to their community, that's going to be a positive thing. And a big one that that maybe doesn't come to mind um, right away with public murals is it can eliminate blight. Um, and when I say blight, I mean um, areas that, like I talked about a little bit before, areas that maybe aren't aren't new and updated and and could use some attention, could use some love. You know, every, every community has these big blank walls that that don't do anything, that don't um, that don't bring any any positive moments. If you can paint on those and give them those colorful, interesting moments, then then it, it, of course, it's going to have positive um, repercussions. Um, one of the uh, one of the other kind of hard and fast rules that we had in both 2019 and 2021 was we weren't going to paint about anything political or religious. We weren't going to paint. We weren't going to make it just an opportunity for people to advertise. It was really just about. Um, about the art and and what we what like a kind of a little saying that we had is with the no politics no religion um we're not trying to change the world we're trying to change our downtown so keeping politics and religion out of it is is going to make your life a lot easier so that's one of the rules that we would recommend to anybody um doing that and then if you can always i, I mean of course i i don't need to tell anybody that staying positive with with the um if there's any message to a mural that's always going to going to create um a better environment so the steps that you need to take or that we would recommend that you take if you're going to do a public mural festival um give yourself at least a year to um to prepare for this cuz um if you're like elko um, all of the all of the people that are helping are going to be volunteers. No, nobody has gotten paid so far. Um, but you know, and maybe that's something that's in the future. But but I don't see it for for at least the the you know for the next few years or for the, for the next few mural festivals. So give yourself enough time, at least a year. When you're out, um, identify the walls you want to paint. And one of the things that we recommend is to keep it all kind of in one area. Our um, our 14 murals that we painted in 2021 were all within four blocks of each other, which makes it funner for the artists. Um, they get to kind of interact more. Um, it, it can give you kind of that festival feel when you can stand in a place and see like like multiple painters at the same time um it's just going to give you kind of that like i said that more festival feel um and then 
you know, then you can focus on another area um, later on. But if you if you keep it kind of tight and focused, it's going to be um, it, it's going to give you a, what we think is a lot more positive result. Um, also, if you have the opportunity in that area, identify extra walls. You know, if you've got, say, you're deciding you're going to have 10, 10 murals painted by 10 different artists, maybe identify 12 walls because some of those artists might, um, they might get done early, they might just be having a great time and they might want to paint something else. Um, in, in 2019, we had basically the entire side of a building, which included um, about, I, I think about 12 different panels that we didn't assign to anybody. We got permission from the owner, but we didn't assign them to anyone. And it turned out to be one of the best spots, um, one of those like selfie spots that we that I talked about. So identify some extra walls if possible that that can just be painted spontaneously because everyone knows that that sometimes the best art is is the spontaneous stuff. So um, then after you've identified the walls, speak to the building owners, get their permission. Um, and one way to to get permission is to because the very first question I guarantee out of anyone's mouth that owns a building that you're wanting to paint on is going to be how much is it going to cost me? Um, and, um, you know, of, I mean, a lot of these building owners might not have a lot of extra cash. So if you can tell them um, and as you're like that leads into fundraising if you if they don't need to pay for the mural that's going to be painted on their building you're going to have a lot better greater chance of getting permission um so what we recommend is to identify um and talk to like a large donor um maybe several large donors we're lucky in um in elko uh we talked to nevada gold mines um, and we talked to the city of Elko and we talked to the Convention and Visitors Authority and got um, and then to our downtown business association and got several large donations. And so then we're able to use that money to pay the artists. So the building owners don't have to pay for anything because a lot of times that's not possible. And you're going to have a lot more success um, getting those owners to to cooperate if you say, you know, you're you're more than welcome to give us a donation, but we don't need any money from you because of our our generous um, corporate donors. So, um, and then start talking to artists. And in rural communities, this might seem like it's going to be hard to do. Um, it's it's not really that hard if you if you make like kind of the whole state your your pool to draw from. Um, in 2019, we also used artists from Salt Lake just because of the proximity. And um, we had a couple, like I said, we had a couple that were international too. Um, so I, identify and secure the artists that you want to work with. And then you're going to have to have contracts. Um, you're going to need an, a contract with the artist. You're going to need a contract with the building owner. Um, as you can, these are the full contracts. You can see we didn't, um, I don't know if this was smart or not, but we didn't have an attorney draw these up. Um, that kept it simple, kept it um, just to a couple of pages. So um, that's for you to determine if you want to do that. But um, if anybody's interested, I'm more than willing to share these contracts with anybody who who wants to. I can send them to Erica and Michelle or or you can reach out to me um, to get these. We're, we're more than willing to share with anybody who wants these. Then three to six months out, connect the owners with the artists. So you've already got the, the walls identified and you've figured out where you can paint, where you have permission to paint. You've identified your artists, then you kind of start connecting them. And um, one of the things besides um, the fact that you can get more more buildings if you don't make the owners pay for it. Um, but if you also, if you're not making the owners pay for the building owners pay for it, then you can give a little more freedom to your artists, um, which is going to get you a better price from the artists too. So if you let the building owners know, like, we don't need any money from you, but we need you to be able to give the artists a little bit of freedom. 
um, then a, a lot of times artists and especially professional artists, they don't get to do exactly what they want most of the time. A lot of them work on commissions and so they kind of have to paint or or create what an owner wants. But if you um, tell the artists like, hey, you know, you're going to have kind of free reign if you give us a better price, then that's going to um, that's going to help to keep costs down. But what you need, but the owners still need to approve. So if you connect an artist with a building owner, they can talk to each other, like, what are you looking for? What do you want? What, what would you love to see? And then an artist can kind of come up with a concept and present that to the owner. And, and that might take a little while. So, so keep that and, and you might have to broker in between. So keep, keep, um, you know, start at the six month, maybe not the three month on this, because that might take a while. Um, identify what materials you're going to need, like start making lists of the paint you're going to need, if you're going to need lifts, if you're going to need ladders, if you want to do swag. Um, in Elko, we, we created stickers. Um, the first time we had t-shirts for all the artists and and all the volunteers, um, anything that you want to you want to give to kind of like a, a takeaway. Um, and then I've got volunteers in bold there. Identify what you're going to need for volunteers and and get them lined up. Um, I'll, I'll just say really quickly on that the um, what we identified that we needed in Elko to do like maybe between fourteen and twenty murals. We need like four to five people. That are that are really willing to to give a lot of time. Um, so depending on how many how many murals you paint, that's going to determine how many volunteers you need. At this point, continue fundraising. Hopefully, you've got large donors. Um, now you you start looking for small donations, um, and in kind donations were really important to us. Um, if anybody's familiar with Elko, we had um, the Stockmans um, and Ramada Hotel. They donated all the hotel rooms during both years. So they weren't able to give a, a financial donation, but it was easy for them to give, um, to just set aside a block of rooms. Um, we also had um, um, Ahern Rental donated all the lifts that we needed. So um, in-kind do donations are gonna be important. Identify the artist's accommodations that you're going to need. If you've got artists coming from out of town, they're going to need hotel rooms. Um, figure out if you're going to um, provide any meals. Figure out if they need specialty paint, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then plan other events that might um, accompany the murals. Like we, both years that we did it, we had an opening reception at one of the um, at one of the local bars here. Um, we also had an uh, both times we had an artist village where artists, local artists that weren't muralists could come and like set up a pop-up tent and and sell sell things. That again is because we had it in a fairly compact area. Um, if you want to do live performance, that's great. Um, if you want to have a gallery show, you know, of the the mural artists that can show their their other stuff, that's that's something that we did in 2019. And the, the most important thing, the thing that's gonna um, create the most success is to figure out how to get kids involved. Um, both years that we did it, we had a community, one community mural that kids were able to come and paint on. Um, they love it, They their parents love it. It gives them something to do. It teaches them about art. It teaches them about their community. It's just, you're gonna have a lot more success if you've got kids, if you give kids um, a piece of the of the festival. So then um, one month out, start advertising, you know, maybe six weeks to one month out, you can advertise. Um, we did in our our local newspaper, we made posters, we got on the rate on local radio. We of course used social media. Um, finalize the contracts with with both owners and artists. And then if you need if you're gonna do an artist village or you're gonna have performers, you know, maybe draw up a little contract for them to just to keep everybody to keep everybody friends. Um, you're gonna need insurance because a building owner is not gonna want to insure um, you know, what happens with an artist. So 
um, talk to a, a local insurance provider. Um, we ended up being able to buy a policy for about $400. So it's not anything that's going to be um, cost prohibitive, but it's going to keep keep everybody safe and keep everybody out of trouble. Um, then you also need to identify and clean any walls. Um, in a perfect world, the building owners would do this, but but we don't live in a perfect world and a lot of times they're not going to. Um, so they somebody needs to. So that's where a volunteer can come in um, and you can get maybe that in-kind donation of a, pre of a pressure washer, that kind of thing. Um, and if there's anything that needs to happen, like like with that would require a handyman, um, one of the walls that we painted in 2021 had a, a swamp cooler that was attached to the outside of it. It was no longer being used, but it just needed needed to be taken down. Um, things like that. Just just prep your walls, figure out what what you need, and and get that going. Um, buy all your supplies. This maybe doesn't need to be a full month, but you need to buy paint. Um, you need to buy, you know, if you need to buy any ladders or anything. Um, we were very fortunate to have one of our in-kind donations was our local Home Depot. Um, they donated um, half the cost of all the paint. Um, so, you know, that when you're identifying in-kind donations, think about the paint too. And then if you want to do any swag, you know, like stickers or t-shirts or anything, buy that. And start on the signage. Um, you're going to want a lot of a lot of signage just to keep the community engaged. Um, every every mural um, we had a, a sign by it that told who the artist was, um, gave their connections on social media. And then of course you you need to identify your donors. You need to identify the building owners that that donated their walls all that kind of stuff. Um, name tags, we we made sure that every um, artist and every volunteer had a name tag. It just makes people, you know, makes people feel special and like they're they're a part of something. So here's some examples of the of the brochure. This um, down at the the bottom here was just a eight and a half by 11 double sided brochure that we handed out to anybody that wanted one. All these little dots are the where we were painting murals so people could walk around and and watch the paint painting going on and then of course we identified the artists um we gave a, a schedule of the fest on the back we gave a schedule of the festival and then again recognized our donors um up here we had a an invitation to the the reception then this is an example of the we these were um 11 by 17 um, and we had them laminated just because they were going to be outside. So, and what that created was a bunch of cool murals in downtown Elko. Like I said, we've we um we painted seventy of them um, in the two two different festivals. Um, these are all from twenty nineteen. Um, if you donate, if you volunteer a lot of time. And like I talked about the that one area where there was um, artists got a chance to just kind of paint spontaneously afterwards. Um, they might paint you. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that this one down at the bottom on the left hand side um, is me. I didn't know that was happening until it was done, but it's kind of a, a, a fun thing. Um, and then in 2021, we had more um, you can see like it just creates these um, really colorful, um, really uh, an exciting area. This this little guy is a like a drain spout off of a roof. Um, that was a spontaneous thing. But um, I, I, when I was talking about eliminating blight, this like this um, building here was, you know, just these big, ugly white doors. And now it's it's kind of a a cool thing. So um, the steps afterwards, um, give donator, donate donors a brag piece to show off. We made posters, um, pay your bills, of course, say thank you to everyone and keep keep a list throughout of, of who you need to thank. And then, of course, let the world know, let the Nevada Arts Council know, let everybody on social media know, let them know to come to your town and and 
and look at your murals. And here's an example of the poster that we gave to um, to the of we we made these posters and then framed them and gave them to all the donors. This was what we put in the newspaper and and on social media. And, and that's all I've got for right now. So here's a, here's how you can contact us and and learn more about it. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was really great. So robust. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So um, just to be mindful of time, we're going to keep it moving. And next we have Liz Woosley. Are you there, Liz? Liz? There you go. There we are. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Yay. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for this opportunity for me to share what's happening in Baker, Nevada. This is, um, we are 130 strong uh, community members, and we welcome about 150,000 visitors per year because we are the gateway community to Great Basin National Park. And you can see on the map, we are right there on the eastern edge of Nevada in um, right near uh, Utah and um, absolutely um, amazing landscape of Nevada that we get to enjoy every day. Just a little bit about me because it kind of pertains to what I'm doing here in Baker. Um, I grew up in a very social and creative um, family, so the arts are in my DNA. Um, it That, you know, kind of segued into me being a risk taker and a mistake maker, and I became an art teacher um, out of college. It was really important for me to share the love of creativity and um, getting messy with art supplies and just the love of arts with others. Um, I married a park ranger and have been following him on his 32 year career with the National Park Service, um, became a mother of two wonderful a boy and a girl, and, and now I'm a business owner. So with my husband's job at the National Park Service, we have lived in urban and rural communities on the east and west coast, and his job even um, brought us to France for five years when he worked for a different organization, but really helped us um, understand different modes of life and different cultures and different arts and different uh, foods and music. And it's a really amazing lifestyle we have led. So his job with the National Park Service led us to Great Basin National Park in 2018, where he was the superintendent for five years. Um, he's just recently retired. So this is kind of a fun new chapter for us here, um, owning a business. But since I, I'm so grateful that all the different um, roads that I've led in life have brought me to Baker and allowed me to kind of see what opportunities I could create in the arts here in our community and with the, the visitors. So over the last five years, I realized, um, you know, I want to inspire creativity always. I want to support artists and then organize opportunities in the arts. So this is who I am. Um, and again, Great Basin is home to the oldest sky, the darkest skies, the oldest oldest trees, the longest caves, tallest mountains, and the quietest trails in Nevada. And that really elicits an emotional response to, the, I mean, locals for sure, because we have a lot of creative artists in the community that do photography and metal arts and um, crafts and things based on the nature around us. But it also um, elicits an emotional response to the people who come here to experience it. I mean, being in rural Nevada for the first time, if you're not used to that, they they come into my store um, really kind of unsure of where they are. So so the arts kind of help them define their experience. But um, Great Basin National Park has created recently an artist in residence program every year. Um, an artist will come from around the country and uh, share their gifts um, to the community through a program. And they get to create their own art as well, inspired by, by the National Park. But they asked me to facilitate the, the school workshops. Um, and so I've been able to meet these artists and see how the kids' response to different techniques, different ways of using materials. Um, it's been a really wonderful program to be involved in. And then in 2020, the art teacher baton was passed to me. Um, so I teach art once a week in Baker School, which is grades three through six. Uh, this year, we have a total of 12 students, you know, that just total 12 students. So it's a one-room schoolhouse with a teacher and an assistant. 
And I have a friend who teaches science on the day that I teach art. So we often collaborate on, on projects, which is really wonderful. Um, we've done, she was doing, I love, I want to just highlight this, the Great Basin Bugs, Creepy Crawly Coloring Book. Um, Carol, the art, the science teacher was doing a uh, unit on, on on bugs and she she creates a bee garden with the kids. So I decided, well, why don't we do a, a an art project based on bugs and we created a coloring book that is now for sale in my store and all the proceeds go back to the art program. And um, the kids carrying the flutes there, we did a six week unit on Mozart's magic flute to incorporate some drama and music theory into the arts. And um, it was a fantastic uh, exploration of operas. And we even did a, uh, what, what are we gonna call it? A lip syncing contest of Queen of the Night's aria. So that was really quite fun. So in 2022, I began a new chapter as a business owner, but I view this as my ultimate classroom because I get to kind of decide what programs I wanna do, what things I wanna sell, and um, again, meet the needs of the travelers. So of course, one of my mission is to support the artists. I've, I've had this dream of owning a little oasis um, in, in a crossroads of outdoor recreation for a long time. And I always knew that it would be about supporting artists. And I, there are many local people have come forward and I sell their works. And sometimes I just buy it outright and resell it. Uh, and, or sometimes we do it on commission based on the, on the price of the work. But it is, I give most of the proceeds to the artists. I, I, I don't make a lot of money on selling art because I want it to all go um, to the artists. And of course I want to have opportunities for locals and, um, and travelers to have uh, kind of an experience with the arts. So I organized my inaugural music and arts night. Um, we have a, a kind of a house band in Baker called the Front Porch Pickers. And that's me carrying the ukulele there. Um, we get together every Friday night and jam on Dave's front porch, hence the front porch pickers. But then they now have, I have a great space in my backyard behind the general store where people can come and relax and enjoy um, the local sounds with the sunsets. And for this arts festival, we created a word wall where people can just draw with these wonderful paint pens. We created an art desk so where people could paint that. And well, I had an old office chair that needed a little fixing up. So people got to duct tape the chair. And you know this helps people embrace the emotions of coming to rural Nevada, experience nature. How do we define that? How, do, how can I express that? Well, the arts help us do that by dancing, by creating some, some artwork, by enjoying music. So I'm really happy that my, my business in, in downtown Baker has become a, that hub of expression. And then I do have a mission, you know, when these artists come to, to Baker, I want to connect them to the school kids, give these kids um, opportunities to expand their, their cultural horizons and learn from others. So storyteller Sam Baker had actually came to Baker um, to do some storytelling workshops with the kids in 2019 and 2020. And when the National Park had its 100th anniversary of Lehman Caves National Monument, um, I wanted to do some programs based on that. And so Sam and his wife, Suzanne, came back to my backyard to tell stories about the area. And, um, and it was just absolutely wonderful to, to make that connection. And then um, this year, well, I wanted in the fall to celebrate the uh, autumn uh, equinox, I wanted to have a barn dance and pie potluck. And I found these wonderful square dance callers from Cedar City, Utah, just down the road from us. And I said, well, we're gonna do square dancing at night, but would you come early and do a school program? And they did, and it was the most fun PE class these kids have had. And then of course the pie potluck afterwards, I think we could solve a lot of world problems if we just came around and talked uh, with a piece of pie. And we recently had a solar eclipse come through our area just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I organized a lot of events in the backyard and, and elsewhere to, to celebrate this um, celestial phenomenon. And I wonderful connection with Nels Anderson of Drum Utah in Salt Lake City. And he came down to do an evening, um, you know, drum circle. But again, I said, Sam, would you come to the school and do a, a afternoon um, circle? And the kids responded so positively. And he did also, He so we're gonna hopefully make him a regular um, in the backyard and, and in the town. 
And then just a week ago, this lovely gentleman, Bill Smith, a poet from uh, living in Parowan, Utah, had come through our um, store in July because he was reading his poetry at the Shoshone Powwow in Ely over the summer. And I asked him to come back and do some poetry with the, with the kids uh, at school and in my store. And he, Bill is holding a book that the children um, illustrated 12 of his poems. So that was our kind of gift to him that we enjoyed his poetry and, um, and he was able to, to read from that book, um, which was really special for him. So, you know, sometimes in the arts, just you can you can organize all you want, but sometimes things just happen and you seize the moment. So this is in 2022. Um, this is in the store. This is a group from the Grand Valley State University. They have for the last now six summers gone to five different national parks and played music that was composed in national parks. So inspired by nature. And they go to those parks and and do concerts, and it's in a National Endowment of the Arts uh, grant that they they do pull from. So they were in Baker, and they were in a you know to to perform at Great Basin National Park. And one morning, I woke up, and my freezer door had been left open. If you could see, there's two refrigerators, and then that last one is kind of dark. Well, things were cold but not frozen, so I had to scramble to save what I could. But the frozen pizzas that I had were were not salvageable except to bake them. So I just started cooking them and passing out slices of pizza to people who were coming in the store. And this group was was in the store and they they had a lunch, nice lunch on me and I enjoyed getting to know them. Well, they performed at the park and then on their way out of town as a as a expression of gratitude, they wanted to perform in my store. So they that that's them all surrounding my shelves, playing their beautiful music that was inspired by national parks. And I recorded some of the music. There is obviously a one about Great Basin. So in the fall, when I was doing an art history unit on Vasily Kandinsky, who had synesthesia, meaning when he listened to music, he could see colors and shapes in front of him. So I had the students listen to that Great Basin National Park composition by Stephen Leas that was performed by the New Music Ensemble as they painted their you know, idea, uh, interpretations of the music through line and shape and color. And then I shared that I, with the, the composer and the director of the group. And Stephen immediately sent me this, po this picture of a Vasily Kandinsky print that he has in his office. So we connected through that. And then he also shared it um, with the National Endowment of the Arts so that he could show them that they're, you know, the music is, he's composing is rippling out into the communities. And the Bill Ryan shared it with the group who was going to do five more uh, national park tours in the West this past summer. And after performing in Yosemite, they came back through Baker to do an encore performance um, in our backyard for the public. So I just love these full circle connections when you just reach out and, and have a moment of, of serendipity and it turns into something magical. And one more serendipitous uh, moment that last October, these two lovely people, Eric and Jessica, stayed at the Stargazer Inn. And we just got to talking as I love to do with all my guests and found out he was kind of a cool blues guitarist from Austin, Texas. And we've connected over social media and had texted back and forth. And I said, hey, um, Eric, if the road leads you to Baker anytime this summer, would you perform at um, our first Friday night market, which we just established this year, uh, first Friday of every month, we just have a big street festival and uh, with local crafters and musicians and all our food entities are open. And sure enough, he and his wife designed a national parks tour to Zion Bryce and Great Basin. So they came back and he played um, right here in our courtyard. And then it turns out that his wife, Jessica, makes jewelry out of his broken guitar strings so now we are showcasing Tesmer strings in our store. And then of course, my favorite connection this year is going to the Basin and Range Exchange in Ely in April and meeting so many wonderful artists um, and uh, motivators in the arts in Nevada. And of course, Joan um, here with me, we decided let's organize the, the Nevada Humanities Program, uh, Nevada PS I Love You postcard project right here at the store. And we did it for, actually, it ended up being a couple of days because once you put art supplies on a table and invite people to sit down, 
just magic, magic ensues. It's, it was just such a wonderful um, occasion. And I'm so glad for all these connections. And it really just helps me realize that if I want to continue on the path of creating an artist in residence program, I'm well on my way. And we just need to uh, formulate that a little further. So thank you. Thank you, Liz. I am so inspired right now by the three powerful women before me. Uh, I'm so excited to open this to panel because there was moments in here I was laughing and smiling and just like, I want to have this conversation right now. Uh, I want to tell our attendees too, we're going to, we're going to have a panel here, but in true community arts development fashion, we're going to open the floor to everyone. And so I'll promote you on, you do not have to turn on your camera. I won't automatically turn on your camera, but when we get to the end, that's going to happen. Uh, Cause I know I'm burning with questions. So I'm sure you are too. And again, I just want to, I just want to thank you three so much for being here. I have way too many questions and I'm definitely inspired by, you know, encouraging children to use art and continuing that legacy and building these connections and doing those serendipitous moments. I will begin, I have, I have too many. Um, so I will begin by asking Liz more about this artist in residency program. So in your proposal application, you mentioned that since BRX in April, you wanted to do this. Um, how do you see your dream vision coming to life? Well, it was it was kind of an eye, you know, eye opening or light bulb moment for me. I said, well, I have a hotel and I have a venue. I can I have an outdoor space. I can create some indoor workspace. Why not connect the two if an artist um, now? And obviously in my part, you can see I have a lot of Utah artists that I've tapped into. But that's because we're so close to Utah. And, and but I'd like to kind of reach out to, to more Nevada artists to come out here. If somebody, you know, again, have to formulate what kind of proposal that they have. Is it how long is it? Um, you know, what are their needs for for lodging? And of course, I have it, but it, you know, cooking and things like that. We have to work that out. But it seems just like so so natural for me to have that as part of of my business. So um, yeah, I'm excited to explore that and read and again make a network of Nevada artists so that they know that this is available in all seasons. I mean, winter is a magical time to be here. We get. Most of, you know, spring, summer, fall visitors, and that's a lovely time, but I'd like to encourage year round um, residencies. So, yeah, I'd love to be locked in Baker for um, yeah. <laughs> months. Yeah. been through there in the summer and that's a little bit of yeah. a different story, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Astrid, I think you can pull a lot from this too. You've, you've rapidly formed a creative district and, and in your application, you stated you do not seek creative permission, which I think is sort of those, those moments. Um, how has this philosophy helped you create so much in such a short time? I mean, like you formed a nonprofit, what, a year ago, right? How, how has that philosophy really shaped what you're doing? Well, we have a philosophy that um, it's attraction versus promotion. So meaning that we're just basically doing a lot of really interesting stuff, um, amplifying a lot of interesting rural artists, bringing a lot of interesting things in. And it's sort of like, if you're interested and you want to come, great. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time, you know, putting out promotion, et cetera, because it's just a creative hub and just come on in. So we also are in an area where it's it's an outlaw territory. I mean, really, truly, that's not even a, a you know, a description that, you know, is embellishing. I mean, we are we're in a really rough and tumble town. Um, these are people that are used to surviving on either very little or whatever it is that's around them. Um, a lot of interesting, eccentric folks in a very small town all thrown together. So that's just how we roll. We trust in the flow like Liz. It's like people show up in our shop. They walk through. We meet them. They're fantastic. And the next thing you know, they're ending up in a project, et cetera. I know we don't have a lot of time left. So I just wanted to say, uh, bring in a couple things. And one is that we really do consider ourselves to be rural artist activists um, we are so grateful to folks that have been willing to have hard conversations about uh, stereotypes about the rural areas. Um, and also just to say that we're very aware of connecting with the folks that are within our community, but also when we are inviting other people coming in, we're very invested in supporting them and their well-being coming into a, you know, a very disenfranchised small white town. 
and being able to see that it's very important to support our artists of color and folks that may not have come in or feel as comfortable in those particular situations. Um, and the last thing is, let's see, just understanding that with all the power that, of the creativity that's happening in the rural areas, there's also a need to understand that that there is there aren't the resources, and that includes things like internet. So when we think we're reaching out to folks with internet, we have to re realize that in the rural areas, a lot of it is just stopping by someone's place, hearing about someone and going out there. So we have a number of folks, for instance, that we know that aren't on this call because they either don't have internet access or whatever. So the way we roll out here in rural areas is very different. And I know, Liz, you know that too. It's that rhizome effect where we just connect intentionally person to person. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I think the three of you really are tying in that uh, element of encouraging people to connect, um, especially when it comes to those serendipitous moments. I just love that term today. And Catherine, I'm going to I'm going to come to you next. Uh, I really loved what you had to say about um, having wall space for people to be creative. Right. It's sort of what we saw with Liz with the postcards and Astrid with the folks coming in. And I think that there's a theme here running about that. Um, and one of the big things I really want to ask you is, I, I know you're doing just a beautiful job building building these places and local character, and you also formed a nonprofit to be that financial arm. Um, but one of the things we hear a lot is we don't want to become an art town, or we don't want murals um, from folks who maybe don't understand the arts as a part of their, you know, civic engagement, local government. Um, how how have you navigated that, right? You've kind of created this arm between government and and local artists. Um, how have you navigated and what advice would you tell others about the benefit of public art in their communities? Um, that's an interesting question. <laughs> so when I put we, you on the hot speak here. We, when we first um, formed the Arts and Culture Board, um, like in 2008, um, it was a group of us in town that just felt like the arts needed um, better representation in in local government. Um, and there was some pushback for sure. Um, Elko is a very blue collar, very um, conservative town. And that's what we love about it. But it was um, it wasn't, you know, sometimes that maybe isn't always conducive to public art, but um, we had to like really work to make sure that people um, understood that we weren't trying to be San Francisco or New York City. That's not our vision for Elko at all. Um, and so the first project that the Arts and Culture Board did was um, a, on the 10th anniversary of um, September 11th. Um, we put a, a sculpture at City Hall and made the community kind of realize like we're we're just as patriotic and we're just as um in love with our small town as as all of you are so i think there's kind of there's really a balance that needs to you know you need to you need to know your audience um i, I mean some of the things that are happening in places like new york and san francisco and stuff that would that would not go over well <laughs> in elko and and that's why we we live here and you know we, we need to just i mean really understanding your audience and and what we realized is that if something is patriotic they're going to get like we're going to get a lot of our community behind it and we're of course going to get our our civic leaders behind it so so that's that first project um doing the this tribute to or the memorial for September 11th and what we what we, it, it was really incredible. If you're ever in Elko, we got a piece of um, an I-beam from the World Trade Center. Um, there wow. were only, I think, two communities in Nevada that, that were granted a piece of that. And so we built the sculpture around that piece. And and that kind of, you know, we we did a good job of promoting it and telling telling the story. And that gave our whole community, like, kind of like they could kind of exhale like oh these people aren't that is to put a, like such an achievement yeah right? they're not trying to put a <laughs> urinal with christ in it on yeah, the yeah. steps or anything like they do in places like new york and so so that initial project really helped us to to bring the community in and then we have this strict rule like no politics no religion like we're 
we're not trying to change the world. We're just trying to change our town. Just like the Thanksgiving table later this month. Um, so I want to actually open it up to the three of you to ask each other questions. I know I provided you quite a few, um, but I think that there might be some synergy here as well. And then uh, we'll jump in and allow people to come come on. And if no one has questions, you know I have more. <laughs> I can I can start this actually. Uh, don't worry. I I definitely have more. Um, I really love what's happening with this sort of individual character, right? I mean, Baker's so close to being towards the um, national park and, and on the edge and, and then Catherine the same with Elko and calling into that Salt Lake community and really being a um, cross state lines, uh, you know, and, and having these local characters. I was in Elko last year in my Nevada Arts Council hat. And of course, once you once you start being in this world and so immersed statewide, you see everything. And so I thought there was such a beauty to local character. And then same with you, Astrid, right? Uh, you know, the, the really fun frontier quirkiness um, uh, of Goldfield. And so I would like to talk more about resources because I think that might be one of the stereotypes that's really predominant in rural communities is uh, not everyone knows how far away the grocery store is. And then even for a place like Elko that's getting bigger, like not everybody knows how far away you are from Salt Lake or Reno where there's these larger services. So can you talk about being in a creative community in, in a, you know, sort of a geographically isolated place? Sure, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, um, again, living in so many different places with my husband's job and we got here and I have never lived in such a resourceful community for such a small amount of like, you know, population wise, a small amount. People wear 18 different hats because they, they you have to, right? You have to. And we have a ranch here where that does have some big machinery. So like when I needed to put the signs up at my store, I asked if, you know, they would help if I could borrow their cherry picker. Well, they did it for me. They came out and they, you know, we just ask and you share things. That, um, you know, again, it's, we are 65 miles from Ely, which is, you know, the first store, first uh, town with services, but we, we can, we're, we're towing the line ourselves for a lot of it, which is really amazing. And again, using your, your, um, your resources rightly when, when one of the resident um, artists and residents came from the, East Coast to do uh, her residency at the park. And the, the first question she asked the kids when she did her program at the school was, how many of you like to play outside? And they all kind of looked at each other like, is this a trick question? Like, you know. <laughs> so it's just, you know, I've never lived this remotely before, but it is so natural. And so when people even come in from the store, from the, you know, travelers come into the store and they say, how can you live here? I said, well, I have mountains, I have friends, I have food, I have the arts, I, you know, it's so simple, but it's, it, it's such a great recipe for, for living. So, yeah. Thank you. I know we feel, I feel really lucky to, to live here in that sense. I am, you're hitting. I'll, I'll kind of, I'll that. add on to that. So um, I used to be on a committee that, because Elko is located right on Interstate 80, which is the busiest interstate in the United States. But, and every place you go in the whole country, people say, oh, I drove through there once because everybody's driven through on I-80. But so I was on a committee that was like, our our only goal was how do we get people to get off the freeway? Um, and I think that's, you know, the, the arts are a, a, the obvious choice for that because it's so instant and it's so visible. So, you know, just just like one sign on the interstate is going to help to get all those like a lot of people off the you know because everybody's got to stop to get gas. So why not stop in this funky little place that has all these murals downtown? You know, so I I think the arts are are kind of just a way to to promote your your community and and it's a a fairly inexpensive way to do it. You know, like you can build a building for a million dollars. Or you can like paint a mural for ten thousand dollars, you know, and and they both can kind of do the same thing to to attract tourists. So it's a it's a fun way to to kind of help the whole community, for sure. Like you said, those selfie moments, but right, it's not in a, a museum made of ice cream or something. It's you know local or international artist. 
Uh, I really am just so grateful. I'm about to open it up to everybody. So I hope your talking voices aren't tired yet. Um, but Catherine, we will grab those contract resources from you and make sure they're they're available. I know Michelle's laughing at me. I'm like, more resources. We also have a um, RFP, RFQ workshop we just did a week ago, and then we'll have one again in two weeks. And so if anybody's more interested in doing public art programs in their communities, that is something we're also thinking about. So now I'm going to invite everybody on. Um, you do not have to ask questions, but please don't feel shy. This is a conversational group today, and we will not turn on your um your cameras or anything. So I will be promoting you to a panelist. You just accept, and then you can come on and talk with us all. And again, I just want to thank you three so much. Uh, unfortunately, I just want to talk all afternoon now and it's still the morning. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. This is a great, just a great little forum that you guys put up. I really love it too, because I'm seeing a lot of names in here that Astrid mentioned. And so that's always so fun to have, you know, the uh, stateside creative community in the room. This is Bea Whitney from Mineral County. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, I was really excited about this, um, this, uh, symposium seminar uh, because it addressed rural areas and um, here in Hawthorne we're very it's very sports centric so even with our uh, uh, county commission and the tourism uh, and uh, recreation which you know could include some of the arts it's it's very hard to, um, you know, to get them to move, although we've got a new director for economic development and tourism and recreation and anything else they throw at him. I feel sorry for the guy, but um, so he's been really interested um, in uh, we we got together with a lot of partners and applied for that 3D grant. Although we didn't get it, we it was our first time and it was a great opportunity to work together. Um, uh, but it's just really hard to um, you know get people to pay attention to the arts. And there's there's always that question about um, what, how to get people into town and then when you tell them how to get people into town, like with, you know, murals and different art projects, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. And then, you know, it's just dropped. It's So I'm wondering how in Baker and, and um, Alco that you were really able to kick some of the government's butt to get them to recognize, you know, how the arts can help all departments. Thank well, you. Yeah, I mean, I can respond to that. Like, sometimes, again, I think it goes to Astrid's, like, I so I don't ask permission. We just organize an event and, and throw it in the air and see where it lands. And, like, for instance, I had, a, I had a, this, this summer, I had an arts in the afternoon event, and four families came. There wasn't a lot, but each family had a great time and it was calm and it was fun. So sometimes it's not, you know, I don't fill the backyard with, with, you know, people, but, but those who come enjoy that. And then maybe they'll tell somebody else, I had this great experience in Baker or, you know, somebody it's a win. It's a win, no matter what, if one person shows up, even like Astrid said, it may not be the crowd that comes like number wise, but how they experienced it. So I would encourage you to just try anything and, and kind of keep the naysayers at bay and maybe invite them and see what they can like. And, and like Catherine said, sometimes you say, oh, wow, that art doesn't have to be so controversial. We'll just enjoy each other and have a good time. Um, so yeah, it, so don't it, ask. Just it's do hard it. to push <laughs> through. It's hard to push through sometimes when you get a lot of pushback, but I encourage you to keep trying. So for our rural areas, oh, I'm sorry. Somebody else has their hand up. We should let them go first. <laughs> 
somebody named Suzanne. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll keep asking. Um, as far as the murals projects, we just had the, we have uh, the El Capitan here in Hawthorne and the general manager just offered us a whole, the whole wall for one side of the building. And it's adjacent to um, a vacant lot. Uh, so that was really exciting. So I, I would really love to talk to you one-on-one -on -one about the mural project. Um, so uh, I'd like to trade some phone numbers with you if that's okay. Um, I would be happy to do that, and and that that makes my heart happy about the El Capitan. So what another hat that I wear? I'm an architect, and the company that owns the Stockmans here in Elko owns the El Capitan in Hawthorne. Oh, and I just did a a project awesome. helping them remodel their their restaurant there, and so I know the guy that gave you that wall, and he has the wall of, like he has a mural on the back wall of the Stockmans here, so he knows. That just that just makes my heart so happy <laughs> that he knows how beneficial those murals can be, and so he wants one in Hawthorne too. I would be I would be happy to to visit with you anytime. Okay, we we have nobody here really has any experience. So at at at, at painting them tech, technical wise, so being able to paint them, or um, but you you know your PowerPoint, and I hope I can get a copy of that. Just sort of laid it out like here's what you, here's what you need to do, you know. Um, Happy to and, share. Happy uh, to share. Great. Thank you so much. Suzanne. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Okay, because I can't see me. Uh, I'm Suzanne Hackett Morgan from uh, Goldwell Open Air Museum in Beatty, Nevada. So hello and good morning. Um, I got to tell you, I've been at this a long time in this state, and this is the largest group of uh, rural arts workers that I've ever seen. So I really commend you because uh, I feel like I have company now. It's great. A um, couple of things I'd like to just throw out there. Um, one thing that we have always uh, talked about, and you've seen a uh, commission on tourism try to promote, are sort of linkages between communities focused on the arts, whether it's the, uh, uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was the Rural Arts Highway between uh, us in Beatty on up to Goldfield, on up to uh, Elko and points, uh, points beyond. I would like, I have always been trying to do the same thing kind of down in the southern part of the state, linking uh, some of our, our neighboring uh, uh, California arts groups in Tacopa, Shoshone. I mean, we're kind of communities that are around Death Valley. And a long time ago, I thought about uh, an arts, an arts, public art, a uh, poker run in the state would be a blast, you know, and would get sort of a different, um, a different clientele out our way. So I just throwing it out there. If anybody's interested, I'm looking for something new to do next year that if we want to play around with that idea, I think it would be fun. Another thing that I really would like to emphasize is that resources, not just fundraising resources, we have a pretty generous state that um, comes through for us with the Arts Council and uh, mining companies, all that. But the the resources that I find most difficult to access are uh, skilled trades that you need when you're 75 or more miles away from any kind of urban center that would have people like that, i.e. carpenters cement people, those kinds of things. And I wonder if, you know, we want might want to start putting together a resource list of uh, arts friendly uh, businesses like that or, or workmen who would be willing to go out to the rural area. I mean, 
every time I need to fix the roof on our Red Barn Art Center, it's a joke. <laughs> I'm trying to find people <laughs> with a letter even big enough to get up there. So I just think that would be really helpful in a state. You know, my, my first experience in the arts was in Montana, where everything was a four hour drive from somewhere. And we're a similar state. You know, we have that same kind of problems. But uh, if we had a resource list of people who would be willing to do work with arts groups out in the boonies, um, I think that would really be a helpful thing. And uh, so anyway, remember my name. We're also <laughs> uh, kind of rebuilding our board. So we're, we're looking for people who are interested in uh, working with Goldwell and our artist residency program and our sculpture park. We'd love Thank to have you. Thank you, Suzanne. And this will be recorded. So you have the audience and floor for anyone who sees us virtually. Yes. Uh, we did lose Astrid because her battery was running low. Um, I'm starting to run over on time, but I want to make sure um, if our two panelists remaining are okay to stay here a little longer with us. Um, okay. Just, just let me know if not, because um, I know we are running over that time we allotted, uh, but Joan has a question and then looks like Tia. And then um, I think it's Bia. Is that how I say your name? Yeah. yeah. Bea, Bea, okay. Um, so yeah, Joan, if you want to take the floor and then we'll go Tia and then Bea. Let's see if I can ask you to unmute, give you an easier option. <laughs> My kids would love to press the mute button. Hey, everybody. I <laughs> just wanted to take a quick moment to say, I am so grateful that um, boy, Nevada Arts Council has knit us together, that Astrid and Catherine and Liz have, have really shown us that art is life. <laughs> art is life, right? Forget Ted Lasso and football is life. No, art is life. <laughs> you, all, you all just embody this spirit um, that is just undeniable and powerful and uh, so attractive that I've been to Baker two or three times and Goldfield three times and Elko three times uh, in the last year. So um, just thank you. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your nonstop energy and flow and for just um, inspiring us. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Yeah, we adore this group right here. Thank you. Tia, you have the floor if you want to take it. Oh, thank you, Erica. First of all, um, hats off to Nevada Arts Council for putting this together. It's so nice to see, um, you know, a light shined on the rural communities that are um, living the, uh, the culture and the experience and the creativity in their own community. And it is just uh, exhilarating to see how they're able to pull their community together um, just by, uh, like Liz says, just put out some um, art materials. Uh, you know, it's our, our <laughs> it's our natural need to want to create. And um, I mean, what a, a testament you guys are to your communities. And uh, it just makes us very excited to be Nevadans. And I personally want to thank you for, for making that happen. Uh, it's just a, a treat to listen to, to each of you, you know, uh, put it out there and make it happen in your community. So build it and they will come. And you guys are perfect examples of that. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Bea, we're going to go to you. And then I think we'll cut it for the day um, and give, give some time back to our lives since we're going a little over. Um, so uh, you want to take it away. I just wanted to tell Suzanne that um, poker runs are really popular here in Mineral County. And I think that our poker run is an awesome idea. So okay, thank well, you. I want to, synergy happening now. <laughs> I want to say that too. Like when she said an art poker run for the whole state, I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> that's so great. I, we have to do it. I'm in. <laughs> so I hear we're having a special meeting later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our poker. Run. I don't know what it is, but we'll let's do it. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I I just want to say again, thank you all so much for being here. I'm really grateful we were able to record this because I think this is going to inspire folks, um, honestly, for years to come. It is so great to see the momentum that is happening and share the stories of our communities and, and share the empowering people who are making things happen. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank this you. was wonderful in my morning. Yay. Thank you all so much. And I just want to say this is the first of many. So um so happy that we had everyone attend. And as we continue to do this, share this with your network, uh, pass this along to anyone else that you think would be a great uh conveyor um for their communities as well. But this was an absolute honor and pleasure. Thank you again to all of our panelists and attendees. Come to Nevada Basin Range Exchange 2025. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michelle Thank and you. Erica, for putting it on. Thank you. All right, Thank you so much. Until next time. <laughs>